The job of decommissioning Japan's damaged nuclear plant is expected to take decades. Workers at Fukushima Daiichi must dismantle reactors, remove melted fuel, and take care of a host of other problems. Four years into the effort, worries such as health concerns are weighing heavily on their minds. 51-year-old Mitsuhiro Maeda has been working for more than 20 years as an electrical contractor at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Maeda supervised about 30 workers at Fukushima Daiichi and took pride in his contribution to the plant. I felt we were helping Japan. We were generating electricity and supporting the country. When the nuclear accident occurred, Maeda rushed to the plant. He worked on restoring external power which was crucial in cooling the reactors and averting an even bigger disaster. Maeda manages his staff from this office. Working in the aftermath of the disaster, he was exposed to the maximum permissible amount of radiation. Health and safety restrictions prevent him from working at Daiichi until next year. <laughs> Someone had to restore power at the Daiichi plant. I just acted because it was my duty. Every day, about 7,000 workers help decommission the reactors. In heavy protective clothing, they carry out such tasks as collecting and storing contaminated water. However, the decommissioning work is expected to take up to 40 years to complete. Keeping stress levels down and morale up is proving difficult. Maeda says a change of mood has definitely come over his staff. One worker is finishing his shift. This man began working at the plant before the accident occurred. He heard that many workers don't talk about their jobs even to their family members. My relatives don't like it. I don't mind if people say, your work must be difficult, but some are really shocked and ask if I'm really free of radiation. Maeda also says it's getting harder to find skilled workers. His company now has only one-third the number of experienced staff it had before the accident. He says the situation is urgent. If it carries on like this, we'll go out of business. Four years after the disaster, decontamination of land around the plant continues. But it is hard to predict when places like Maeda's hometown of Namie will be habitable again. This is my field. They say it's being decontaminated, but many residents are losing hope of returning home. Maeda is helping decommission the reactor out of a sense of duty to his hometown. But he sometimes loses his faith in the future and is starting to doubt whether it's a good idea to continue his business. We need to figure out how to pass on this responsibility to the next generation. Otherwise, I can't see a clear future for the power plant. Reducing the risk of radiation and improving the working environment is important, but these efforts are not enough to secure workers over the long term. Those on the front lines also need to have motivation and hope. Well, managers of many firms in northeastern Japan have spent the past four years trying to stay afloat. They've been forced to rethink their approach in the wake of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Now, some are focusing on robot technology that could help meet the challenges at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. A new industry is in the making in Fukushima. It's a robot business. This remote-controlled robot can work in disaster areas where we humans can't. Noritaka Baba and other entrepreneurs started a company that develops robots. They're finishing a prototype. 
ちょっと感動しました。<笑>まあ、本当にすごいなと思いました。But why robots? The reason is the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident. It forced many residents to flee the area. Baba and his team wanted to build their own robots to help dismantle the reactors. So people can return home. What's important is that we people in the region do this locally. Some firms are using this opportunity to get out of the subcontracting business and become independent. Before the quake, this factory used to make tanks for nuclear plants for major firms. But the tsunami destroyed all the machines in the plant. Orders stopped coming in. The firm was swept to the brink of bankruptcy. We lost our clients, so we had nothing to make or sell. I wondered whether I should continue to run the business. His company had been a subcontractor for 70 years, but he decided to produce robots on his own and help rebuild his hometown. Everybody said from the very beginning, But a little company like ours can't make things like robots. We studied a lot, we stuck to our decision, and things eventually started getting easier. Aikawa's firm is now trying to develop a firefighting robot. He says it can go into a burning forest. He wants to improve his robots so it can handle some of the decommissioning work at the nuclear plant. We want robot makers like us in Fukushima to create more jobs and sell their robots across Japan and even abroad. That's our eventual goal. Fukushima's robot industry isn't just about reconstruction from the disaster, it may grow into a business that can compete with global players. Local business owners in northeastern Japan were hit hard following the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Employees at one boiler making company in the city of Kamaishi saw plenty of adversity in the months after. But they've been able to turn things around by taking some innovative steps. Kazutoshi Nogami is the head of technology for a boiler manufacturer in Kamaishi, Iwate Prefecture. It's a small company with about 10 employees. City officials asked Nogami and his colleagues to help process debris from the disaster. The firm then developed a boiler for generating electricity. The tsunami deposited close to 1 million tons of debris in Kamaishi. That's equal to about 55 years worth of household garbage for the city. It was a major obstacle to recovery. Nogami developed a way to use the mountains of rubble to fuel his boiler. The resulting water vapor would produce electricity. I focused on using debris as fuel. I really believe it was a disaster that forced me to think outside the box. Most of the tsunami debris had absorbed large amounts of salt from soaking up seawater. And the salt reacts with the metal walls of the boilers when the debris is burned. This causes corrosion. Nogami had his work cut out for him. It took him three years to develop a unit that can handle this kind of damage. And in 2014, his product was ready. Conventional boilers take the form of a single tube. Nogami decided to divide the unit into three parts. This would allow workers to easily replace any section damaged by corrosion. His boiler can be repaired in half the time it normally takes. He also redesigned the inside of the boiler so combustion efficiency doesn't decline. 
We found ourselves in an extreme state of having nothing. But that situation was exactly what motivated us. I believe that was the key to our innovation. This new technology is creating a buzz in Indonesia. Palm oil producers were looking for a way to get rid of the husk left behind in the production process. Indonesia is a major exporter of palm oil. The industry generates about 200 tons of waste a day. And it contains salt, just like Japanese tsunami rubble. So incineration using boilers was impractical. Indonesian officials hope Nogami's technology will help the industry dispose of the palm husks. This boiler will help solve our country's problem. We hope it's the breakthrough we were looking for. Government officials are considering Nogami's proposal. The deal, if they buy, could be big. The business would be worth about $1.2 billion. We can go global by honing our debris-related technological skills. Maybe looking back, we can say the disasters presented us with a way to improve our products. The operators of tsunami-affected companies are turning the hardships arising from the disaster into new business opportunities. The huge earthquake and tsunami that pummeled Japan's northeast region four years ago devastated local businesses. Seafood processors, one of the region's key industries, were hit especially hard. About 80 percent of the small and medium-sized seafood processors along the coast say sales are still below pre-disaster levels. Some are fighting their way back on the global market. NHK World's Keiko Aso has more. Ishinomaki in Miyagi Prefecture was hit by a tsunami of over 8 meters. Houses and shops along the coast were swept away. Fish processing was almost wiped out in some parts. 40% of the seafood processors that stood on the coast are still closed. Even the plants that have struggled back on their feet face serious challenges. This farm processes oysters, scallops, seaweed, and other products. It lost its factory in the tsunami, but reopened two months later in a makeshift building. Yasushi Kotono is in charge of sales at the company. He was dismayed to find that some pre disaster customers started buying seafood from other areas while his company was on its knees. I don't think supermarkets can turn their backs on producers that helped them out while they couldn't get produce from us. The luck of Japanese customers has forced Kotono's <laughs> company to seek new business opportunities overseas. His small company has a limited lineup of products, and it doesn't have the brand power of its bigger rivals. So, Kotono has built up a business consortium with five local seafood processors. By working together, they can now sell Kotono's oysters and scallops, as well as their grilled mackerel and smoked yellowtail, over 100 items in all. The shift didn't come cheap. To be competitive overseas, Kotono's company invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in a new refrigeration system. The new system freezes food instantly. It protects the taste of food by not destroying the cells during the freezing process. So Kotono's products keep their flavor. With its expanded product lineup, and a new refrigeration system in place, the consortium has launched sales abroad. In February, Kotono met with officials from a Taiwanese food import company. He brought with him six processed products, including oysters and salmon. 
He says the frozen oysters stay fresh and delicious even after six months. The technology gives Kotono the competitive edge. I tasted his oysters today, and they're really good. I'm sure this is going to be a very popular and essential item in our restaurant. We have the processing technique to preserve the natural flavor of the food. I hope I can take advantage of Japan's great freezing technology to offer delicious foods that can be enjoyed in all seasons. Kotono and his partners are exporting to five regions and countries, including Hong Kong and Singapore. They are aiming to double the consortium's exports. Keiko Aso, NHK World, Ishinomaki. Well, the people at Japan's agriculture ministry set goals for the country's ability to feed itself, and they plan to lower their target in their next 10-year policy outline. It would be the first time they've done that. Japan is currently aiming for a food self-sufficiency rate of 50 percent by fiscal 2020. But the actual level in 2013 was 39 percent. Some people say the goals should be more realistic. Ministry officials now plan to include a target of achieving a 45 percent rate by 2025 in the new 10-year basic agriculture policy. They plan to encourage young people to take up farming and boost consumption of domestic agricultural products. Delegates from around the world are heading to a city in northeastern Japan that was hit hard by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. They're taking part in an international conference on disaster risk reduction, which opens Saturday in Sendai. NHK World's Moshe Komata has more. UN Secretary General Pan Ki Moon is among a number of high-profile delegates who will attend the conference. He spoke about his expectations before heading to Japan. I'm confident that the resilience of the Japanese people will inspire uh, participants uh, to agree on bold outcome uh, for disaster risk reduction. PAN will join more than 5,000 people from around the world. They'll update an international framework to reduce disaster risks. The original one was adopted 10 years ago at a conference in the western city of Kobe. An earthquake in 1995 devastated the area and killed more than 6,000 people. In 2005, UN officials urged countries around the world to learn from Kobe's experience. They called on conference participants to build better infrastructure and educate people on disaster mitigation. Following that meeting, some developing nations have increased preparedness. They've conducted drills and built disaster-proof communities. The top UN official for disaster planning says the participants at the conference in Sendai have a lot to learn from the 2011 earthquake and tsunami in Japan. They will be able to meet communities and the people, so they get much closer to the realities of a catastrophic event and its aftermath. UN officials say they hope discussions will be more concrete because the conference is taking place where a disaster actually happened. Participants will adopt an agreement before they wrap up the five-day meeting. Moshe Komata, NHK World.